OK, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this talk. And um, thanks for sticking with all of this. There's a bit more work on GPUs. So we're going to mention GPUs again in here. Um, my name is Gary Frost. I'm going to talk a little bit about a building on top of some of the work that we've already seen. So for example, Paul talked about code reflection. Mauricio has been talking about uh, Panama. Oh, I apologize. There you go. All right. Uh, Mauricio has also been talking about Panama. And what I've been trying to look forward to is how we can use some of these technologies that are emerging and going back and look at a problem that I've been interested in for some 10 years now, which is how we get Java to interact with GPUs. And I think this is a sort of proxy as well for Java in interacting with other devices, accelerators. And also, I think it will work. Um, there's going to be similar problems that comes up in the machine learning world. Um, so I think in, when I talk about GPUs here, I'm really talking about it again as a proxy for looking at machine learning. Uh, so here we are, sort of. Um, the agenda we're going to look at is we're going to look at GP compute, what it is, why should we care about it. Um, anyone who knows me probably knows I've been banging on about this for the last 12 years. So the question, haven't we already done this already? Didn't we do this a few times? And then in order to answer that question, I'm going to go and look at some programming models that we tried and what we learned from them. Some things we got right, some things we got wrong. And a lot of the problems that we had, some th things were problems with the... Um, the Java virtual machine, things that we couldn't do at the time, things that we can do now. Other problems were we tried to wean people away from uh, the programming models that, were, that GPU, GPU programmers had evolved over the years. We tried to magic them away and tried to hide it behind other APIs, and I think that was a mistake. I think we have to go back and deliberately open up some of the APIs that have been successful in that world. Um, and then I'm going to present this idea for a heterogeneous accelerator toolkit which sits on top of Panama. So it's a hat that sits on Panama. You're there already. Um, and this particular proposal is going to look at an ND range proposal, which is very much like GPU use at the moment. Um, we're going to lean on Panama a lot. Um, in fact, I came to Panama for the fact that it was a better JNI, but I stayed for the data layouts. The data layouts are very, very useful in this particular domain. I'm also going to use code reflection because code reflection is much better than trying to lift and buy car, bike code. I have the scars for trying to do that in the past. And in fact, uh, Brian's work and the work that's been done recently on the class file API means that if we do have to lift up from bike code, there's a really nice API for us to use as well. And at the end, we'll look at a summary in the QA. And if I don't run out of time, I have a demo that I can walk through. Um, so. You guys know what a GPU is, just, that, just for the abstraction. Uh, a GPU is a sort of this graph, graphical processing unit. The thing that makes them very diff different from CPUs is there are a lot of cores, thousands of cores. We, you know, we hype up tens or hundreds of cores in the CPU world. We have thousands of cores available to us on GPUs. Um, and the, what we have to sort of consider the programming model is very much Imagine you had a thread per pixel on your screen. That's the sort of thing that we're looking at. Imagine you had a thread per pixel doing work just for that particular pixel. Um, and so conceptually, we have this idea of a, a very small piece of work, a thing called a kernel, traditionally called a shader, and the work that that particular thing is going to do used to just color that pixel. In fact, if anyone's ever played with shader toy, you should go and play with it. It allows you to write little functions that just color different pixels. And it's amazing what you can get out of that. Later on, people started to realize, they started to get envious about the compute power of these particular devices because they're very powerful. And they started to um, perform a natural acts with uh, the shader APIs and actually get them to, 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 to work in other domains, work in general computing domains. And that's really what GP, GPU is. It's trying to use the devices that we've already used for GPUs and bring them across for doing stuff that we might find useful in a different context. Um, and the way in which we do this, essentially, is we Initially, we would start to make our data look as if it was a vertex buffer or it was a pixel buffer. And we would go and modify it. Into a, we'd write a kernel that modified it into a data format that was useful to us. Um, we would send the data and the kernel across to a GPU device, usually across DMA. And then we'd execute it, and we'd get our data back and make profit, because that's what we're all here for. And the reason why we do this it's sort of performance, really. It's a great performance tale. I mean, we all look to Moore's law. We see how that all works out. This particular charts here are showing the, the data from the top 500 website. 
So this, if you go back in time, is telling us in gigaflops, left-hand column, log scale note, um, it's telling us the compute for the top 500 um, computers, both um, the 500th position within that, that's the yellow line, the red line is showing the winner that particular year, and the blue line is the complete total teraflop compute capability of all of the entries that per year, so for the whole 500. Uh, what's really kind of fascinating is if you go down to um, Amazon and you pick yourself up one of these GPU cards, and if you could get in little Doctor Who's little tired there and go back in time, you could place one of these one of these devices on the top 500 list. All right, you don't have to go back as far in time as you might imagine as well. This particular device would be in the top of the list in 2012, something like that. And that's to me that's mildly astonishing that we have a device capability that is equal to a placement on this list. Anyway, even this laptop, um, the GPU in here is a nice, it's a nice GPU, it's 10, 10 teraflops. I don't have to go very far back in time in order to get this on the top 500 list. They're very capable devices. We have learned how to deal with the, the CPUs from Java space. We really need to try to wrangle these uh, GPU devices as well and make them work for us. So the programming timeline, this is GPGPU, not necessarily Java, has been around for a while. So 2003, people started to play with um, using um, GPUs for doing general compute. Um, and really the dominant leader here was NVIDIA. They came out with CUDA. And that was a sort of C99 based language. You'd write a little fragment of code, which was a, a function essentially, which turned out to be a kernel. And they provided all of the host code for you to ship that across to the GPU and get it to run for you. You would ship the data you wanted, your, your kernel, it would do its work, and you pull the data back and you would use it back on the, on the host. Uh, OpenCL is a sort of open, it's more of an open standard. Um, lots of contributors. Initially, it was sort of Apple and AMD and all the folks who weren't clever enough to start CUDA, truthfully. And they, um, they came together and they built an open standard. The nice thing about this open standard, it was very well adopted by, by lots of folks. Um, it also allows you to write a kernel, a little fragment of C code, you compile it, you push it across a queue to a device, and it runs. Underneath, the programming models for these are very, very similar. Um, and they've been very, very consistent. The other three at the bottom are really just showing that we've derived, we've gone a little further. We've taken Sickle, for example, is a C++ wrapper that sits around OpenCL. So you can now put your kernel code in the same source as your, as your host code. So you don't have to compile it separately and let them meet together at runtime. And AMD is Rockham. Um, basically, it now allows you to take CUDA, CUDA code, which will they'll transpile into their particular backend so that they can actually now take CUDA source, which is quite nice. And the one API coming out of Intel is also trying to do this thing where we, we can't start to bring this all together. So we, we're now compiling single source. But the programming models basically give us two things, and that is a kernel, a function we're going to apply to our data. The thing that's interesting about kernels, if you've never thought about this before, um, the way a kernel works is it's working on one single piece of data. It's usually occupying a core, um, but the way these guys get lots of latency or hide lots of latency is they have one instruction decode for a whole group. You may have a group of 512 cores. One instruction decode, every kernel steps one instruction at a time. They stay in lockstep. Uh, this, is, this is good, you save having to have an instruction decoder per core. The bad news is when you want to branch, it's a problem for branching because you all have to branch together. You have to stay tied together. And there are tricks that they can do with masking individual lanes off to make it and using conditional instructions to make it look like you're branching, but you're really just turning cores on and off for certain lanes in the execution. Um, the other part of their programming model is this notion of a grid of execution. So we're used to in Java having a thread or a bunch of threads, we launch them, and we give each thread a bit of data to work with, and it goes off and does its own thing. In the GPU world, the only piece of information that a kernel has that's different from anyone else is its own personal ID. It gets an ID in a grid. So we may launch a one-dimensional grid, one array, of 1,024 kernels. The only thing that's different between one kernel running and another 
is when it asks what its thread ID is, it's one or two or three or four. All of the rest of the data provided to the kernel is identical or uniform, as they call it in the GPU world. And they're broken up into groups. So we have these, we have a bunch of these kernels that are all going to be launched in a bunch of groups. And they can communicate with each other in a group, but generally it's very limited communication. Um, just to see Java's not been um, out of the out of this scene, we got in fairly early on. There were JNI wrappers around the outside of JOpenCL and, and CUDA. Um, there were a couple of other projects. I was involved in Apparapi. There's another one at the same time, which tried to take Java bytecode and lift it up so that we could turn it into the C99 code for kernels. Um, later on, there was a, an OpenGDK project called Sumatra, which tried to go a bit further. And it was quite successful, but it was pretty much tied to hardware that was fully coherent, and we'll talk about that later on. And uh, later on, I think Tornado is probably the state of the art at the moment. I know Juan's going to talk about Tornado a little bit later on. I just want to go briefly through the programming models so we can see why, where we've come from. In the past, in the first third iteration of this, we basically had the equivalent of what you did if you ran J-Extract on the header files for, J OpenCL, for OpenCL. You would end up with just native JNI sort of bindings that would take you into the low level OpenCL calls. Sadly, if you were a Java programmer, that meant you had to learn how to write OpenCL, and then you had to embed them in strings and ship them in your code. So there was a lot of code that looked like this. All the host setup code and device choosing and when pushing things into queues and whatever was very explicit. You had to handle it yourself. Uh, Apparapi, as I mentioned, did a slightly different way. It allows you to write your kernel in Java code. You've extended a base class and overran the run method. And that run method would be turned from bytecode into OpenCL. And in the case of root beer, that was, came out all, within weeks of each other, these things actually came out. It was a CUDA based, so it would do the same thing for CUDA, although they used an interface, which is probably smarter, actually. Later on, when lambdas arrived, kernel, we could have lambdas in kernels. We could put a kernel into a, and have it execute within Apparapi. And this was a model that we kind of pushed all the way through to Sumatra. When we were running Sumatra, we basically stole the parallel int stream, and we used the stream of ints that came out of this as our unique IDs for each kernel to execute. So that's, where we, that's how we actually use the stream API. Tornado, then, I want to talk about a little bit because we're going to steal some ideas from Tornado. Um, Tornado offered a, a data parallel, sort of open, C, open ACC style. They had an annotation on the for loop. Um, it's a programming model that I don't personally go for, but the great thing about this particular an annotation is it's very easy for Java programmers to grow up. Everything inside that loop at the top there will get turned into a kernel. You don't have to separate it out and make it something else. Um, the, th real, the thing that Tornado really brought to the table is they realized something that we'd all missed, and that was just running a kernel fast is not going to do it. You get, the, you get throughput out of GPUs by scheduling lots of kernels to execute in a graph of execution, and actually interleaving those nodes of the graph with the data that you need moving backwards and forwards. If you don't combine that graph together and just and pa pass it over to the GPU in one session, then you, you can't hide latency. All you can do is run Mandelbrot and run nBody. You can run the very basic kernels. That's not enough in a real world environment. Tornado realized this, and so they provided this task graph mechanism, which allowed you to describe moving data to the GPU, run this kernel, move the data back. You could explicitly take control of it and therefore avoid movements that you don't need to make. They also came out with a second API, which I actually much prefer because it's far closer to what OpenCL or CUDA currently have. And that's this sort of um, model, which they call a kernel API. And that's the one we're going to borrow. Um, this is one where a function represents the kernel the first argument of which represents your link back to the GPU. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but this whole function now will get turned into a kernel. You still dispatch it in the same way, but instead of you now having a loop inside your kernel, you'll, you describe the number of times you want to run as part of the dispatch. This is far closer to a traditional GPU offload. So at this point, 
looking back on all of this stuff that's happened, we got a bunch of questions that we kind of like, what, we, we made bets early on, what were the good bets, what were the bad bets? And early on we kind of, should we really want to code uh, kernels in C99 or string templates as we might do it now? Do we really want to, do we want to be able to link from GPU libraries that currently exist? And I think we do. Um, should we use builder patterns? Earlier on, Paul was talking about what a builder pattern looks like where we sort of fluently start to build up chunks of code. That's mildly horrible. Um, can we automatically extract Sumatra style from the int stream or some other stream API? Should we reconstruct from bytecode and, and so on? We had all these questions. I think the question that's really become interesting with Panama is should we pass heap allocated data? Um, with J and I, that was a problem for us. And I'll talk about that in a moment. I think we should start limiting our data representations to off heap. It makes things a lot easier and also allows us to uh, exchange, we, we can actually allow the GPU to allocate data now, which is it can allocate much more efficiently than we can on its behalf. Um, and also, um, Tornado did bring this notion of a task graph, but I actually think that it's possible now that we, we can actually construct the task graph itself um, on the fly. We'll talk about that. So this is where I think we are, looking back on the decisions we made in the past, the things that I think. We can go, we'll go back and we'll, we'll review this slide later on when we see how um, code reflection and Tornado help us um, head off some of these points. That little box on the right hand side there is just really to describe some talking points that I would really like to bring up in a workshop. Because one of the problems, and Paul sort of hit on this slightly, and, and that is we're, gonna, we're starting to describe chunks of code which we have no intention it's ever going to be run by a JVM. What, what does that mean? How, if it's a restricted form of Java, how do we restrict the user from writing something that we didn't expect? Like, for example, if you put into a kernel, I would like you to throw an exception at a particular point. That, that means nothing. You're not going to get an exception thrown on the GPU. And if one of the five million threads that you launched did throw an exception, what does that mean? It, it, that's not their programming model. That's not how that works. And then the other part is um, some constructs that we would not naturally put in, we would need to put into GPU code just don't make sense in the Java world. Java has a, sorry, a GPU world has this multi-tiered memory hierarchy. We have no such thing in Java and we probably don't want one. It doesn't make sense. So we would not want Java code to execute and we don't want to introduce a tiered memory model to it. So I think we're going to have to find a balancing act somewhere between what we can express in Java and make sense on the GPU rather than trying to achieve all of the things that we could do on the GPU. So the heterogeneous accelerator toolkit is really just stealing everybody else's work. I'm taking the stuff that Paul's doing in the um, code reflection and the stuff that Mauricio has been looking at in Panama and layering a, a thin layer on top of it, which now exposes what I think we could now do with GPUs that we couldn't do in the past. And this is how it all fits together. The, an application gets written on top of the, this, this hat, which is themselves are sitting on top of code reflection in Panama. We're sitting on the VM and they're striding now a GPU and a CPU or an FPGA or whatever your accelerator of the day is. Um, and all that really the, this hat has to bring out is an ND range, a real ND range API, very similar to the Tornado one, but with some tweaks. Um, the big takeaway here for me is, you, as I said earlier, you kind of come to Panama for the function API for getting native calls, but you stay for the data. Because what's actually happened here is we've also constructed with Panama, because the GPUs expect C99 style, layout, st style layouts and Panama can create them, we can actually create data that can be consumed by the GPU directly from Java, which is something we've not been able to do before. Um, so we're going to use code reflection um, and the glass file API to lift up if we need to or to take a model of data so that we can send it off to create a kernel. We're also going to use code reflection to take apart some compute functions um, so we can analyze them for their data patterns. And the Panama, FM, the Panama FFM API, we're basically going to use the data. We are obviously going to call some native code because the, the drivers live in native land. But most of the use of Panama here
is for us to put data together in a way that more efficiently gets to the GPU. And we've had fun in the past with JNI, and I'm glad that it's over. I mean, every so often, we, you know, you, you forget in the GPU world, GPUs use a lot of async calls. Go and put this on the queue, put this on the queue, put this on the queue, and it wants to decide when to take it off. And in the, fast, in the past, we've had great fun with the GC, because by the time the GPU got around to wanting to move it, the GC's moved it, and so therefore it wasn't where it was. So the great thing about Panama is we can sidestep all of that. And this last point is by coordinating how we wrap layouts. I think this is gonna be a key going forward. In fact, even beyond this particular project for GPUs, the key to, mem to machine learning um, and a lot of acceleration technologies is we need to be able to package data up in such a way that we can pass it from one producer to a consumer without the Java virtual machine really getting in the way. One of the reasons I think Python is very successful is, is it's very, it, it doesn't do the compute itself. It's very good at taking a blob of memory over here with some information about its stride patterns and passing, passing it across to another blob over here and getting out of the way. It's good at getting out of the way. Now with Panama, I think Java's good at getting out of the way as well. So the programming model proposal is that we basically use the a class of, as our level of encapsulation. You'll notice I've annotated the class to be code reflection class. Um, I think Paul talked about this at the moment. We're doing it per method, code reflection. But I think there's a case for having it on the class itself. I'd also prefer to have a compute annotation which code reflection is inferred by it. But for the moment, we're just going to use code reflection to tag the class. And then we'll put our kernels inside this particular, and they look similar to Tornado VMs style kernels. The kernels in there take this thing called an ND range, ND. The first argument to a kernel is always something that represents the range. Remember we said each kernel has to work out what its ID is. Am I number, what, what is my number in the, in the, in the vector? Um, and it does that via the first argument. Uh, so this is just, a, and then we'd have some arguments. And all of these arguments are wrapped segments. These are wrapped Panama segments. So as I mentioned a moment ago, this first parameter is how each of the kernels is going to work out what it is. In this, in this particular world, you can get a lot of information as you're running along about who am I, what group am I. Each kernel is asking these questions. Who am I, what group am I in, how big is my group, how many neighbors to the left of me are currently branching, how many neighbors to the right of me are currently branching. There's a lot of information that a kernel can actually extract. It has to get them from somewhere. So that's the purpose of this first argument, is so that the kernel can query that information. And each of the vendors all do the same thing, but they all call their APIs a different way. So we can standardize that so that you make one way of calling this information on the first argument, and, you know, and the vendor will plug in their implementation underneath. And a similar thing happens, there's capabilities that we have in the GPU that we don't normally have in Java. So it will make sense also for us to post, place those capabilities in this first argument as well. So for example, if we want to create a local barrier, a barrier for this group, we may as well use that first argument. We're gonna use that first argument to go and create the barrier for us. It doesn't make sense for us to allocate an object represent the barrier because that doesn't make sense on the GPU side. We'd have to map it. And there's a lot of capabilities that we can extract through this first argument. So within our compute class, we've talked about the kernels. The other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce compute methods. So this is an example, of, oh sorry, we've got this, this is two kernels we've got in here. The other thing we can put in here is a compute method. Here my compute method's called mul. It's going to call the mul kernel for us. It's our entry point, the thing that's going to dispatch the kernel for us. We're gonna pass in a notion of an accelerator. An accelerator is an abstraction around a vendor provided runtime. So it might be an abstraction around CUDA or OpenCL or one API. A vendor would provide the implementation of it. We're just surfacing it here as an object that represents the accelerator. And so that accelerator it can actually be any code at all. It isn't restricted at all. Unlike the kernel code, which is gonna be restricted to stuff we can run on the GPU. 
So in order for us to be able to execute this particular MUL operation on a matrix, for example, we would have the, we'd create ourselves an accelerator, and then we'd tell the accelerator to basically go and um, compute the MUL method that was on this, and pass the arguments in from the outside. The reason we have to do this is it's pretty much like you know, the difference between thread.run and thread.start. With something, the accelerator has to step in at this point. You're not really calling this method. We're giving it to the accelerator so the accelerator to decide how to call this method. Um, so that's the programming model here. We basically ask the accelerator to go and perform this particular operation. It only references compute operations. And we can put any other methods we want in there. We can put data, we can put any data we want in there into this particular class, but this is a unit of compute. We don't go outside of it. We can compose, in as much as if we had other libraries over here that were already pre-canned, we can call those within the same compute math mechanism. But we have to form a closure over all of the code. So our entry point for our compute method dispatches kernels. And, uh, and this particular example is one where we've hidden the accelerator completely by creating it within the, within the, the, the class itself. So then the question is, you know, where the tornado quite rightly brought out this notion of building task graphs. Where, where did that go? Um, we have, we've not included a task graph. And I think for most cases, the, I think in all cases, there is no general reason for us to create task graphs. Because we've given, via code reflection, we've given the accelerator a model of the compute entry point. And so the, and we've given it all of the code that's in the kernels. So it has all of this information. So actually the accelerator can walk through the model and say, ah, this guy is calling this kernel, he's calling this kernel, and he needs this data to be in this place at this, the appropriate time. We don't need to break out and write down in a graph form what the data dependencies are. They can be inferred from the data. This particular case, for example, mul kernel only reads from the left-hand side and right-hand side and only writes the result. We don't, have to, we don't have to pass result to it. It's gonna fill it in. We can infer that from the fact that the kernel is how it's accessing the data. And it could also determine that it needs to pull the result back, back because it was written to by a kernel and Clearly, if we wrote to it in a kernel, we needed it back in the, in the call site. So we can, in many cases, we can take the call, we can take the call graph and build it internally on a, automatically. So what happens when we have more complicated sequences? So what happens when we have, for example, this is a um, integral image. It's used quite often in image processing. It's a way of comparing areas of, um, of an image with each other. Um, as a, like a, like a lookup table. Um, the, the, the trick with an integral image is every pixel in the, in the integral image is the sum of all the pixels, the pixels to the top left within the image. Um, and that, that therefore allows you to determine the area, the average area of any portion of the screen by just subtracting the diagonals from each other rather than you having to go through each pixel, summing them up and averaging them. So an extraordinarily common um, utility that we quite often build. It's made up of three kernels. The three kernels are we convert the image from RGB to grayscale, we compute a, a, the X portion of the integral image, and then we compute the Y version of the integral image. If we actually look at this, we can see that the, uh, if we were to give the, if we just left this, built this up, and said, how many transfers do we need to make without any knowledge at all of what the kernels did or what the compute did, to be perfectly safe, we would need these 12 transfers. We would have to move data in. We'd have to move data back just in case Java touched it. We would have to move it back in again. We'd have to move those 12 transfers we have to take. Just through code reflection, actually looking inside the kernels and proving that this particular buffer is read or written to by a particular kernel, we can start knocking off transfers. We know we don't need them because they're not consumed by the kernel or the kernel hasn't modified it so we don't have to bring it back from the device. These are all optimizations we can make just by looking at the code that's um, inside the compute. And similarly, um, these two buffers that we allocated here, which were temporaries, we allocated them in here 
They built data for one kernel to populate and for another one to, to, to consume. We don't need to have that allocation happen on the Java side. That can be moved completely down now into the vendor's code. The vendor can put it somewhere next to the GPU, somewhere where it's never going to be copied. We can get rid of the copy and the transfer. So again, this notion of having code deflection looking over the compute mo method allows this graph to be built um, without you having to describe it yourself. And the other thing that you can do um, is we can do this with loops. Quite often, a compute happens in sort of loops. Like kernels, will, a kernel will be just sick batch, it will mutate data, and then we'll keep calling the kernel until that data is steadied out, come into some sort of state that we're interested in. So we might, we're waiting for data to converge. Um, we can't describe that in a graph. We, we, a, dra a graph is just going to give us a sequence of operations. We can write code that has loops, and that loop can get turned into the appropriate dispatch patterns. And this is an example of two very common patterns uh, that, we, that we use in GPUs. Um, the, the main thing that I think is going to be important for GPU offload is the Panama um, wrapping of segments. Um, where in Java, we might have a particle described x, y, and z, or so, sorry, x, y, and, and its mass, because we're going to do some in-body style um, simulation. In order to get this data to a GPU in the past, we had to separate them out into all the floats, and all the, the doubles and the floats would be set separately because we, could, we had no aggregate. We had no common language to speak between the Java side and the GPU side to describe what an aggregate was. And also, we could only pass on heat allocations. And they had to be primitive arrays. And so in the past, we would break this into parallel primitive arrays, and we'd pass them as separate arguments. And then the kernel itself would sort of look across this smeared data and try to recompose the original intent. And of course, Panama offers us the flexibility of building segments to describe this data. So this is going to allow us to describe far more interesting data to pass to the GPU. Because the GPU is expected C99 style layouts, we can provide them directly now from the Java side. And of course, because we've got the segment description, we can repurpose it to create the type defs and the unions that we're going to create in the generated code when we're generating the kernels. Um, the one thing that I struggled a little bit when I started using a lot of Panama is, or the FFM um, API, was that we, it is possible to use var handles and therefore tie things together, but it gets a little bit verbose after a while. I think there's going to be a case for wrapping this layouts and segments together in such a way that we don't have to go through the var handles or we don't have to go through. Um, and the, the reason that we partic is particularly useful in the GPU world is when we're setting up the data from the Java side, we're going to be writing a lot of data to set it up. And then on the GPU side, because we're now saying the GPU should be written, the code should be written in Java, we're reading that data out of these same data structures as well. So I think they need to be wrapped. Because um, that particular piece of code top left was what we would have had previously using um, primitive arrays. The bottom right, it starts to look a bit more complicated because we have to know about the layout, we have to communicate the layout to the back end so it knows how to take the data apart, etc. cetera. Um, and this is just something that I think, I always think of Panama as a layer that is really going to be excellent for, for library writers. The end user probably won't, they'll, they'll prefer it to be hidden from them in some sort of wrapper. They can do it but I think there's a, a wrapping layer needed. I actually did this using interfaces, which has proved pretty successful for me. I nest interface, in, uh, interfaces that map onto my data. This is a table of particles. It's a list of particles. I create an interface for the table. I create an interface for the particle. I put the layout inside the inner interface, and I put getters and setters on the interface, and then I use proxy to spin up an implementation of this, which ties all the var handles together, so that I just end up with an instance that I can call the getters and setters on um, to actually get in there. This is really nice, because I have my GPU code can use exactly my Java code, on the GPU can use exactly the same description as my Java setup code. 
And I've hidden the var handles. The var handle would mean nothing to a GPU, so we'd have to find some other representation to get across to it. And so if you look in the code, here we're sort of saying, now I can just allocate a table of particles of 1,024. In this particular case, I can ask it for the nth particle out, and I could get and set on that particular particle. There are other ways of wrapping, and I know that the Panama team are looking at other ways of wrapping. I'm using proxy. I think another way of doing it is spinning up the methods themselves as method handles and hiding all of this from the, from the user. But I think a layer is needed. Uh, so this is what our code looks like afterwards, after we've been through this particle table. Um, the, the Java code is the bottom right, that's setup code. Top right is what a kernel might look like. It's a perfectly reasonable kernel code. And it can be taken apart and turned into C99 code. Because the same, because the accelerator knows the pattern used to build the wrappers, it can use that in-depth knowledge to spin the code up that needs to read from the wrappers in the target machine, if that makes sense. And just, to, you might need to borrow Paul's glasses for this. And so this is a lot of, a lot of code. This is, this is actually a real um, nested, I can nest these interfaces all the way down. This is actually a table of features for a hard cascade face detector. Um, each of the features contains three rectangles and it, also can, and it also contains two unions, which are gonna to point to left and right nodes or point to left and right values. These are all just nested interfaces. I throw this description on the left, which is quite verbose, but manageable. I throw that at this proxy library, and it spins up all of the code that I could use from the Java side and from the GPU side to access this particular data. When I implemented Har Cascade back in the day with Apparapi, and even with Tornado VM, I had to slice out the individual arrays of ints and floats in order to pass this data over, and it's particularly tedious. So this is gonna open up a whole new way of communicating with GPUs. And just to sort of go back to this chart earlier, the things that we thought we wanted, things that we th didn't think we wanted, this is how code reflection has solved the problems in yellow, and how the FFM API has solved our problems that we had in green. So these two, I'm heavily leaning on top of these two technologies uh, in feet in, um, that hopefully are coming down the line that we can all use. So in summary, we discussed Java GPU. We talked about layering on top of code reflection and on Panama and how this is gonna allow us to look at this space again. I think we're now at the point where we can reassess whether Java GPU is a possibility and we described how they fit together. The next step really here is to, once um, code reflection comes out as a project, is to bundle in an implementation of this heterogeneous accelerator toolkit along with the code reflection. Um, and then go with vendors to look at agreeing on data types and how we data wrap, and also looking at what sort of libraries we might want to incorporate in that they, they, they're already providing. And then we look at its specification and sort of prototyping. And we, I really want to work with vendors. They are the best people to write the backends. I can write that. I have, I have a CUDA and an OpenCL backend for the work that I've been doing so far. Um, but really, they're the best people to write their backends. Uh, this is a hair, I'm going to do a demo of a hard cascade. Briefly, a hard cascade is a tree of structures, which are like little half features, they're called. Those are these little white and black multiple rectangles, three, three rectangles or two rectangles. Um, they're built into a tree, and what basically happens is you throw a pixel image at the top end, and it starts to try to match light and dark areas against the image. So there's little overlays, they sit in those overlays. So to find the face on the left, we might have a, a description of a feature as being these two things that look like the eyes. So it's looking at the relative light and dark of those particular regions using the integral image that we talked about earlier. And if that passes, then it will try another feature, and it's built into a tree. It's fail fast tree. So the most discriminatory um, test is put to the top. The cascade that we're going to look at is 25 stages. So we're going to run one with 25 stages. The numbers ramp up. There's a reason we do this on the GPU. The numbers ramp up pretty quickly. We've got 25 half stages. Uh, that's 25 trees, and there's 
nearly 3,000 features. So for each part of the screen that we think might be a face, we're going to run through this cascade. Um, on an image which is this size, um, at seven different scales, because the other thing, we're looking at a rectangle, we can't just look on a grid rectangle, we have to overlap this rectangle because the face is not going to be aligned up inside the grid for every single one. And similarly, we have to look at different scales. We look at this size, the next size up, and the next size up. For this particular image, we're going to require us to look at two million scaled rectangles. That turns out that we're going to visit 130 million half features, and we're going to do um, 271 million rectangular area maps on the data. Um, if I can get out to my main screen. So I'm now going to run it in pure Java mode. So this is the Java implementation, pure Java implementation, no acceleration whatsoever. Um, and this is my image. Oh, sorry, this is multi-thread. So this is multi, this is actually using the parallel stream. So this is actually doing pretty well. This is, this is, and it's fine, found 352 faces. They've done it in 522 milliseconds. And now I'm going to run, but allow it to go off to the, the GPU. I'm also showing on the bottom. I didn't show it before. That's, the, that's what an integral image looks like at the bottom. It looks weird to us. In fact, remember, the, we're, not, we're not looking at the image. We're looking at these two integral images at the bottom to pick out those faces. They're, the, they're those uh, summed area tables. And we have 53 milliseconds. So even though this is a nice, meaty machine with 12 cores, um, the cores, the GPU cores are able to beat it out of the order of magnitude. So, anyway. Oh, this is my start my slide so from here. Uh, so there, there are the numbers we pulled out of there. I actually have a sequential version of it. It actually takes about three and a half seconds. You can see how probably work out roughly how many cores I have from this. Um, you can see the, you know, the sequential driver, the parallel driver. We're all using the same data structures, both ends here. So this is the power of Panama, allowing the data side and the GPU side to use the same stuff. I think I may have a few minutes for questions. Yes, one. Okay, it's great to see that there is a proposal for, for MDRS, for example, etc. I wonder, so you mentioned that for, in the case of Tornel, to get rid of completely of the task graph, because you can uh, somehow uh, detect data and code. But one of the purposes of the task graph is, as we have it now, I will explain later as well, that we can define, for example, when to copy data in and out. So, for example, if we want to execute a whole bunch of methods, but we don't want to copy out every time, we can say user defined, and then at runtime we can say, ah, now copy out. But how can you detect that automatically for your? Uh... Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's multiple ways of, sorry, there's multiple ways of, the question was, um, with the task graph the Tornado VM provides, you can actually, because you can define the order, you could maybe, for example, you could say, this is a large buffer. I'm going to put it at the top. <laughs> and, and because we want these buffers to overlap, we want them to bo both be there. But we want them to happen in parallel. You can control at a fine level when it needs to be there. I, don't, I think the same thing is true of when you automate the task graph. You have exactly the same information in the sense that you know, this, you know what's consuming the data. You know what's providing the data. If it's dirty, you know to move it. Um, but you can also move it uh, as early as the first observation that you see that it's data. Yes? Oh, absolutely right. Because I think what you're thinking, you're thinking that the code that's in the compute method is executed Java bytecode. And it's not. Remember, the compute method is a model. We have a model of it. The vendor will then work out the task dependencies and the data dependencies, 
and they'll either they'll do whatever they want to do to do that. So they may well schedule up and build your task graph from it to make it dynamic for their particular case. They could also do loops, um, and they can also they can have much finer control over it because they can do it conditionally. If you never if one path never modified the data, I don't need to move it. So you can actually have it look at the data to see if it needs to move it. And it can do that cheaply on the GPU side without bringing it all the way back to the Java side to work out whether the data got modified. We can talk, yeah. Ah. Um, yeah, so, um, John? Uh, you, you mentioned uh, allowing C99 text in string literals. Uh, as if it were a good thing. Uh, what, so, what would that be used for, and why is that a user model? That, a okay, yeah, model so, that yeah, that is a good question because we, we, I started off poo pooing it when it was in the early versions of, of Jockel and JVC. Um, there are some implementations of FFTs, for example, which are text. They're textually defined. The, the best implementation of OpenCL, you can just go and pick it out of like a recipe book. Um, it, for some of those, I think they're pre-canned. They'll just be chunks of text. There's no reason for us to, to try to recreate that from bytecode. Also, they can use some real features that they understand that they can query at runtime on the underlying hardware. So for pre-canned library things, I think it's perfectly reasonable that some people might still want to go back and create string. And I think the new template formatting is going to be really cool for that because we can target it at a particular, almost like a DSL-shaped language. Sorry.